to Strange New England. I'm Tom Burby, your host. Today's episode, The Men in Black, The Main Encounter, the 1976 Herbert Hopkins case. It is September 11th, 1976. You're sitting quietly in a living room near Maine's Old Orchard Beach. The sea air is strangely balmy this night as you settle down for a quiet evening. Your wife and children are out for a few hours, and for once, you have the house to yourself. You're 58 years old, and your name is Dr. Herbert Hopkins. And your quiet life is about to encounter a roadblock that will send you careening into an area you've glimpsed but never visited before. Though you are a renowned allergist and have done research for years on the causes and treatment of multiple sclerosis, you've been going down a slightly different avenue in your career recently. For the past several weeks, you've been engaged doing what you most enjoy, hypnosis. The most interesting work of your career has been consulting on a case of alleged UFO teleportation in Oxford, Maine, of David Stevens in 1975, work you find both fascinating and difficult to dismiss. Lately, it's been keeping you up at night, pondering the possibilities of such a thing. How strange that so many people are convinced that they're experiencing things that, well, simply cannot be. Perhaps tonight you'll review some of those tape recordings of the sessions you've had to see if you can find your way into this strange case. Did these abductees really see strange mushroom-headed entities inside their ships? The peaceful silence of the evening is disturbed by the ring of the telephone. You answer, hoping it's a wrong number, but instead... You hear a strange, faint voice of a man who tells you that he is the vice president of the New Jersey UFO Research Organization calling from a phone booth. He has heard of your recent work, and he wonders if he might stop by since he's in the area and discuss your findings. This piques your interest. Another researcher into the phenomenon that is so troubling you might be interesting. You agree, telling him your address. You hang up the phone and switch on the porch light so that when he arrives, he'll know which door to approach. But when you flip the switch, you see him mounting the steps, already at your door. There he is. You're puzzled, since the closest phone booth is several blocks away. Startled, you open the door and quickly allow entrance into your house, the single strangest visitor you will ever have in your entire life, a man possibly not quite of this world. And so begins one of the most famous encounters in the strange history of the men in black and one of New England's closest encounters with them. For the uninitiated, men in black are usually black-suited men, often arriving unexpected in pairs or trios, often late at night, whose provenance is dubious and whose purpose is unknown. They often arrive in black vehicles directly after a UFO sighting to speak with those who've witnessed the lights or craft in the sky. However, whenever people have reported meeting these mysterious beings, they're often left with a profound feeling of unease and distress. Who did they really just meet? What did these people actually want? Or were they even human at all? Dr. Hopkins let the man in before he even knew what was happening. His guest was impeccably dressed in an apparently new suit, black pants perfectly creased, black suit coat, tie, and shoes, sporting a starched white shirt. He also wore gray leather gloves. On the top of his head was a black hat, which the man removed, revealing a perfectly smooth, bald head. Dr. Hopkins realized before he had even spoken a word to the man that he was totally hairless. No eyebrows or eyelashes at all graced the man's face. 
Also, even in the dim yellow light of the hall, he could tell that his visitor's skin was pale to the point of being nearly white. The only hint of color about him was his deep red lips. Later, Dr. Hopkins would swear that the man was wearing lipstick. His nose seemed too small for a man of his height and stature, and his ears were very small as well as appearing to be lower on the head than they should have been. Hopkins invited the stranger into his living room, and they sat opposite each other on the chair and the couch. The stranger asked about the hypnotism sessions with the supposed abductees, and Hopkins answered all of his questions, even though the strangeness of the whole encounter was beginning to have an impact upon his mind. Who was this man, really? He seemed to know things about the case that only someone intimately involved with it could. Why was he asking questions if he already knew all of the answers? With every answer that Hopkins gave to his inquiries, the man would repeat the exact same phrase. Yes, that's the way I understand it. And then it occurred to him that he did not know the man's name. Things immediately began to steer towards the unknown, and Dr. Hopkins found himself in the presence of something else, something other. First, the man mistakenly brushed his lips with his gray gloves and a portion of his lipstick smeared off, revealing that indeed he had no lips at all. And then he pointed to Dr. Hopkins' pocket and observed that he had two coins inside. This seemingly random observation was true, though how he would have known this was beyond the good doctor. The stranger requested that Hopkins remove one of the coins and hold it in the palm of his hand which he did. Watch the coin, the stranger requested. As Hopkins observed it, his vision began to grow fuzzy and then to waver. After it changed color, it simply vanished. The man then said that no one on this plane would ever see that coin again. The conversation was steered by the guest to the Betty and Barney Hill UFO encounter from Exeter, New Hampshire, in 1961. Their conversation went as follows. Do you know what happened to Barney Hill? asked the stranger. No, I don't, replied Hopkins, except that he died. Do you know what he died from? asked the stranger. A heart attack, I'm guessing? No, that's not entirely accurate. He died because he knew too much, replied the stranger. And then he arose slowly and awkwardly and began to move toward the door. With slurred speech, he said to Hopkins, My energy is running low. Must go now. Goodbye. And with that, he left Hopkins, wondering who he had met and what had just happened. He rushed to the door to watch the man depart, but all he saw was a very bright blue light bathing the parking lot outside of his home. Were the man's words about Barney Hill a threat against Hopkins meant to stop his research on the hypnosis case and walk away? As time passed, Hopkins became convinced of the truth of this idea. If this had simply been another human being advising him to stop, he might not have. But because of the high strangeness of this man's behavior and appearance, there was no doubt that he would comply. He erased all of the tapes from the prior session and stopped working on the UFO abduction case altogether. He discovered later that, of course, there was no New Jersey UFO research organization, and like so many people who have claimed to have had interactions with these beings, he felt like he'd been contacted and threatened by these entities. The 1976 Herbert Hopkins case remains one of the most detailed reports of an interaction with a possible man in black. People who study the phenomena seriously often cite this case as the most important and informed report ever recorded about the ominous visitors in the night. However, a good story doesn't have to be real to be appreciated. It is possible that the experience, as reported by Dr. Hopkins, was a fabrication designed to draw attention to his work and his own odd need for attention. 
Though the source of the following information is no longer available on the Internet itself, it is available at the Internet Archive's Wayback Machine. It's in the form of a blog written by his nephew, also named Herbert Hopkins. In his entry for January 13, 2008, he reveals to the world his intimate knowledge of the whole episode and explains how the whole thing was a desperate grasp for attention from a brilliant but troubled man. Herbert Hopkins writes, quote, My uncle was unfortunately a fantasy-prone individual, craved the center of attention and limelight, and on a base level he sometimes just made things up, no matter how hyperbolic, to top everybody else. As brilliant as he was in many areas, however, he was unskilled at fiction, and for much of the 70s and 80s, he was an alcoholic. Every night was spent alone with a magnum of wine. The bottom line for this particular man in black tail is unfortunately pretty mundane. This mysterious being in black inspired by cheap fiction and alcohol, probably less of malicious intent and more from some sad need for attention, was, alas, a simple lie, one that needs to be corrected for those into serious research in this area. So, who are we to believe? The good Dr. Hopkins or his nephew? Was he truly threatened or was he simply seeking attention? Whichever way you choose, the story remains interesting and continues to dwell in the annals of the mysterious and the lore of New England. Perhaps when we consider things that are truly strange, the strangest of all, might, after all, be the people who claim to have experienced impossible things. I'm Tom Burby, and you've been listening to Strange New England. For more stories like this, please visit our website at www.strangenewengland.com. All of our stories are also accompanied by audio podcasts that are freely downloadable any place you can download podcasts. Thank you for listening.